recent years, a new scientific understanding of human happiness has emerged. Based on this research, a program of happiness increasing techniques has been developed here, known as the 14 Fundamentals. The 14 Fundamentals are the work of Project Director Dr. Michael Fordyce, a world-recognized leader in the field. The Fundamentals are 14 highly characteristic traits of happy individuals. Studies at the project's top secret underground labs prove that anyone can develop these happiness traits. And as they do, they become much happier people. The 14 fundamentals are be more active and keep busy, spend more time socializing, be productive at meaningful work, Get better organized and plan things out. Stop worrying. Lower your expectations and aspirations. Develop positive, optimistic thinking. Get present-oriented. Work on a healthy personality. Develop an outgoing social personality. Be yourself. Eliminate negative feelings and problems. Close relationships are number one. And Val Hat, the secret fundamental. Welcome, my friends, to the second program in the Psychology of Happiness series. Now, this program is entitled, What Happy People Have, and it examines, as the title would imply, what it is happy people have going for them that average people and especially unhappy people do not. In fact, you'll find out a little bit more about your own personal happiness in this evening's program as you find out what it is that these happiest people we've studied in the research have that perhaps you yourself don't. Now, we sort of examined last program what the most important thing in life is, and I think we came to the conclusion it has to be personal happiness. Well, this evening we continue on as we examine the second greatest story ever told, the story of happiness research, and begin to find out. Certainly some people are happier than others, so what is it? that happy people have. Oh, thank you, my friends. Welcome, welcome. Well, that's, that's too much. That's too much. Really. Great, but we can edit some of that out. Uh, that's wonderful. Welcome, my friends. We're going to continue on with, I think, what we referred to last week as the second greatest story ever told. Is that correct? Yes, we were talking about the second greatest story ever told. And obviously, what is the second greatest story ever told? Yes, way back there. You can't hear him, but I know he's responding well. The second greatest story ever told. No, I'm sorry, the story of happiness research. That's it. The story of happiness research is indeed the second greatest story ever told, my friends. I think we began our discussion last week with uh, addressing to you one of the more important questions that mankind has ever asked itself. What is the most important thing in life? And I think the majority of you, as most groups that I have uh, lectured to over the years, came to the conclusion that indeed it is personal happiness. And then we went on, I think, to understand perhaps a little bit better why personal happiness is so important, why it is the single most important thing in life, or at least one of the most important things in life in almost anyone's scheme. We talked about two or three other top choices, and we have them written here on the blackboard on both sides, of course. We're going to have to put that back and forth this evening. But uh, such things as love, success are important, health is important, religion is important, but happiness seems to rise to the top. And I think we made that point clear as we began providing you all with some choices. You know, if you really had to choose, say, for example, between success or happiness, would you really choose success knowing you'd never have a happy moment again? Or happiness and uh, money, all the money in the world, but would you really choose the money knowing you'd never enjoy a moment of happiness again in your life? Now, most of you kind of realize that as nice as success, money, love, warm family relationships are, 
they're all not quite as important as that basic feeling or emotion of happiness. And I think we uh, kind of explain that to you a little further by uh, letting you know that things like success, things like money, things like uh, social status, in fact, virtually every human endeavor can really be understood as a means toward the eventual end of happiness. And I think that's the easiest way to understand it. So if I were to ask you why is happiness the most important thing in life, the answer really lies in the kind of idea means versus ends or causes versus effects. The idea essentially is that it's the net effect of happiness that we desire and virtually everything else we involve ourselves in is primarily a cause to get to that effect or a means to eventually approach that end. Now, so we went one step further, I believe, also as we began to examine what happiness actually is. The one thing that everybody seems to want. The interesting thing about that is I think that we discovered that even though happiness is something that most people would select as the single most important thing that they want from life, it is one of the most largely misunderstood, or I'd rather phrase it, you know, one of my famous quotes is it's one of the most ununderstood. That's far beyond just simply misunderstanding it. What I say by ununderstood is that most people don't even begin to comprehend what is happiness, even though they seem to want it more than anything else in life. Well, it's hard to understand what happiness is. It's hard to define it, primarily because it's so close to us. It's so much of an inner part of our psychological experience. But I think we decided last time we got together, in our last uh, little you know, seminar here, that happiness is really what? Nothing more than... Yeah, it's a psychological state, but a special type of state of mind. It's an emotion. Happiness is nothing more or less than an emotion or feeling. And it is synonymous with a variety of other emotional terms that basically convey the same positive kinds of feeling. Such things as fulfillment, contentment, satisfaction, joy, elation, peace of mind. Many of these emotional states, really on a physiological brain, you know, uh, chemistry level, are essentially the same thing. So, we finally came full circle last week in deciding that the most important thing in life was happiness, and yet happiness is nothing more than this feeling. Apparently, this feeling is what we're living for. Life, apparently, is nothing more than an attempt to, you know, experience happy emotion, and at the same time, as we talked about last week, to reduce or eliminate negative, unhappy, guilt-ridden, angry, frustrated emotion from our lives. A very simple two-fold strategy. I believe we did cover most of this last week, did we not? Excellent. And I think we're ready or prepared to move to the next exciting step. And that is, as we begin to continue, you know, to discuss the second greatest story ever told, the story of happiness research, I think last week we indicated that there were two basic findings, that one of which is transparent, very obvious, and that is that certain people are obviously much happier as a general rule than others. Now, it's not that these are extremely happy people that we have studied, you know, experience, uh, it's not that they don't have their down days, it's not that they have not had their little bouts of depression from time to time. The important thing is, however, that as a general rule, they tend to enjoy a much higher level of happiness day to day, week to week, month to month, perhaps year to year, than do average and especially than the many unhappy individuals that, you know, are everywhere. Perhaps, you know, you are one of them, perhaps uh, your friends are in that category who find a really happy day something very, very rare. You know, it's, it's, it's a, a rare experience to feel really contented, really satisfied. Their life is so much more filled with frustration, anxiety, fear, you know, resentment, bitterness about the past, you know, bouts of depression, disharmony with their family, arguing, fussing, you know, stress and pressure on the job, and that a happy moment is like a vacation in a life of regular unhappiness. Well. That's one of the obvious findings. People obviously do vary in their happiness level, but I think the most intriguing thing is to why. <laughs> My friend. If you've ever been curious about that particular question, and I imagine up till last time we got together, it had never really occurred to you, but now that I ask, would you like to know what it is that the research has discovered that happy people have that most average people and especially unhappy people don't. I see them all nodding their heads. Yes, indeed, they want to know. They really want to know what happy people have that they probably don't, but they're not going to like the answer. Because unfortunately, the answer is practically anything and everything you can think of. 
To begin our lesson this evening, what happy people have that you probably don't, or what is also parenthetically known as the bad news of happiness research, we can begin with one very simple idea. And this is a kind of an overgeneralization, an overview of the, all the findings that have been reported regarding the nature of happy people. Now what I'm about to present to you basically is an overview of the findings that has been generated in several decades of research on the nature of happy individuals, not only in this society, but worldwide. And it does seem to have a lot of cross-cultural uh, validity. People everywhere seem to, in a broad general way, rely on the very same sources of happiness. In other words, it's the same things universally that seem to contribute to people's happiness. And like I say, if we could reduce it to just one simple overriding conclusion, <laughs> excuse me, uh, we would have to say, my friends, that happy people have it made. Happy people indeed have it made. They have more of the good things in life in greater abundance for longer periods of time than do average and especially than do unhappy people who have little in the way of the good things in life to claim for themselves. Now, the fact that happy people have it made is the overview of what we're going to be talking about this evening. But interestingly, you all discovered many of these important happiness traits or happiness causes as we created the big board in the sky last week. That's what we've entitled this, the big board in the sky. And interestingly, as you all were kind of helping me create a menu of the good life, inadvertently you came up with the, the majority, really, of the most important ingredients or the most important correlates. Now bear in mind as we go over these lessons this evening, these are very general statistical trends based on thousands of people placed in the old computer hopper. There are obviously going to be, or there, you know, apparently there are exceptions to all of these rules. Every one of these principles is not ironclad. But as a general view, we can suggest that each and every one of these have a tendency to contribute to happiness, and in a way the model is kind of additive. In other words, the more of these happiness sources you have going for you, and the greater or the more rewarding each of those sources are, the happier person you tend to be, and likewise, the happiest people seem to kind of max out in most all of these categories. So what are they? Well, let's look at the eight categories we created on the big board in the sky the other day. First one, of course, is the social category. And it incorporates all of these social kinds of things, friends, family, and active social life, organizations, clubs, things along that line. We had a second major category, which was the success category. It, too, very important as far as happiness goes. We had the happiness category itself, and so we'll kind of discount that. As you remember, happiness is the point to all of this. The rest of these simply means or avenues to approach that ultimate end. Then on the back of the big void in the sky, since we couldn't really spread it out like we would in a normal classroom, we have the, uh, well, the beautiful world category, which is represented by my viewing, or my drawing here, but of a beautiful world. <laughs> That's beautiful. We had the big R, which of course stands for religion, my friends. Uh, we had the health category, physical health. That's one of the other independent categories. We had the fun category, all of the fun activities, leisure time, sports, you know, things along that line. Vacations, travel, adventure, mystery, intrigue, suspense, and adventure that you could possibly do for kind of fun in your life. And then finally, we came up with the mental health or the healthy personality category or what we might call the self-actualization category. Different terms describing one's emotional state, all right, psychologically speaking, their mental health simply put. Now, you have basically, therefore, seven choices in the riddle I'm about to present to you as we begin our journey here across the big boy in the sky. And the question is this. One of these seven categories, it might be success. <laughs> it might be the social category. It could be fun. It could be the big R. But one of these seven categories tends to, according to our best research, have a much greater effect on personal happiness than any other. So much so, we consider it the number one most potent category for personal happiness. Now, what would be your best guess of these various categories as to which would have the most potent effect on personal happiness, according to the vast majority of people that we've studied worldwide? How many of you would vote for success? Uh-huh. Yeah, I see a number of hands there. How many of you would vote for, you know, health, physical health being the most potent? How about a whale of a lot of fun, my friends? Huh? 
Yeah, a number of votes there. Uh, how about one's mental health status? I don't know, but we see a number of votes there. Or how many would say the social category? Well, those of you, and, oh, I'm sorry. How many of you apparently just don't think at all? Yeah. Yeah, that's typical. Well, for my friends, those of you who guessed the success category, but, I'm sorry, you're incorrect. The data speaks very, very strongly that of all the categories or of all the impactful things that affect one's happiness, it is the social category that is the number one category of personal happiness. Happy individuals are remarkably socially oriented. They tend to be very socially active people, and their life seems to be much more geared around good, warm, you know, successful social relationships and a wide variety of social contact than do other people. And it does seem, therefore, that our data also suggests that good social relationships seem to be one of the strongest, if not absolutely the number one strongest impact for the average person's happiness. In other words, as one psychologist wrote, happiness is indeed other people, or at least that's the way it appears according to the research. Well, that's the number one category. Let's go for a second guess. Now, the second question is basically this. We talked about the overall categories, but let's look for a second at the individual items and to see which one of these items would you say places a greater impact on personal happiness than anything else. In other words, if you could only have one of these particular things, which one do you think would have a greater effect on your happiness? Now, we really haven't divided these things down, but we consider those a choice. Any ideas? Excellent. Oh, they're all just jumping up and down, as you can tell. They're not really, actually, that's why I guess I'm up here and you're out there, huh? Think about your own life. What has been the happiest period in your life? If you think about it. Yeah, and what have been the unhappiest periods that you've had to endure? Very same thing, my friends. Usually the loss of love. Therefore, we find that of all the individual sources of personal happiness, the one that has the greatest effect, the most potent effector of personal happiness, is indeed that close... Love relationship, my friends, that close love relationship. Now, that's pretty obvious. Like I say, as you examine your own personal life, probably the moments in time that have been the most exhilarating, the happiest periods of your life is when you and Mr. or Ms. Wright, or at least who you thought at the time was, were falling in love. It's an exhilarating time. Everything seems perfect. You're overlooking all your shortcomings. You're not seeing the world realistically at all, but who cares? You're blissfully happy. And unfortunately, if you look at the other side of it, the unhappiest period of life for most people seems to be occasioned by the loss of love, either through death or divorce, separation, when a close love relationship that's been, you know, something uh, very concrete, very stable, begins to dissolve before one's eyes. So, if you examine your own life, you begin to see the incredible, impotent, I mean, the important impact of a close love relationship, and yet most people seem to ignore this. Now, it's kind of sad, as we'll come back to in later lessons, because unfortunately, the most potent source of personal happiness is also one of the least controllable compared to perhaps some others. So let's go item by item across the big board of sky here and see if we can learn some important lessons from it. We said the social category is the number one source of personal happiness. Let's give a personality portrait of the happiest individuals. To begin with, they're remarkably social. As I've suggested, their social interaction level is extremely high compared to average and others. On a formal level, out in the community, out in the town, out with people, they tend to be tremendously active. They're usually joiners, members of all kinds of clubs, organizations, do a lot of volunteer community work, active in politics, with civic groups, things along this line. They tend to enjoy an active social life of parties, get-togethers, hosting parties, going to social events. In other words, the happy person tends to be a highly social animal. In addition to that, however, it seems to be the closer relationships that also display a high level of rewarding interaction because happy individuals tend to be both quite loving as individuals as well as receive a great deal of love. They may not have many more friends than the average person does, but the quality of those friendships is usually very warm, very rewarding, very positive. They tend to have a much broader array of acquaintances, though, and people that they deal with. They tend to actually even prefer jobs, as we get to it a little bit. They're much more social in nature, dealing with uh, people much more than things or ideas and concepts. The family life of the happy individual tends to be incredibly warm, you know, very positive, very rewarding in that sense. Now, this is not only the family 
that they create with their children, we'll talk about in a minute, but it's also the family that they come from. And one of the interesting side lights to the research that we have noticed is that happiness does seem to have a kind of an intergenerational sort of a spread to it. It doesn't mean that it's genetic, but it does seem to indicate that your adult happiness has something, not a great deal, maybe a 10% edge, something to do with how happy or unhappy your parents were as individuals. Well, those of you who were fortunate enough to come from a family environment where your parents were, you know, kind of always happy and just, well, just happy. I mean, it was kind of silly, but your folks were always happy. It probably gives you a much greater potential and a much greater possibility of happiness in your life uh, yourself. On the other hand, indeed, if your parents were not particularly the happy type, if you didn't see a great deal of joy and bliss around the old family household, but a lot more arguing, fussing, pressures, problems, tension. And indeed, that perhaps may somewhat lower your potential to happiness, although it doesn't doom you in any way. The important message, I think, however, is for those of you who eventually consider having families yourself or are currently parents. It would appear to me that one of the finest gifts you could provide your children is to become a happy person yourself. You can't beat that winning or that kind of all-win scenario. In other words, by fulfilling yourself, by becoming as happy as you possibly can be, obviously you're going to feel better. And in addition, you may well greatly increase your children's potential for a happy life too. So that's a kind of a nice sort of an all-win situation. What about children? Well, my friends, interestingly enough, Despite the strong cultural emphasis on having children, especially for women in our culture, there seems to have been, at least traditionally, you know, perhaps these days things are changing somewhat, but I, in my dealings with students, even young ones, find that the old myth of childbearing and happiness going together seems to be pretty much alive and well. There's always been this kind of an idea that there's really no way to live a fulfilled and happy life, and life I'm sorry, unless indeed you do have children. The research, however, suggests that this is possibly not the case. Our data indicates that children are sort of optional when it comes to the big happiness picture. Apparently, couples who have children are not particularly any happier than couples who choose or end up not having children. In fact, in the old days, we used to call them child-less couples. These days, in the literature, more and more, we're, hearing, or we're seeing it referred to as child-free couples. And apparently, child-free couples are just about as happy. In fact, our recent studies indicate perhaps a little happier than childless couples. Well, say you've already made the mistake, what can you do? Well, the number of children, perhaps that's a clue. Maybe if you had all boys, maybe if you had all girls, maybe if you had two children, three children, five children, or the national average of 2.3 children, what is the happiest alternative? Well, the data once again suggests that there's no way to particularly come out ahead in any of those categories. So in a sense, children are optional. With them, without them, one, two, five, or 50, <laughs> if you can manage it, the happiness rates stay approximately the same. Now, in a way, that doesn't discourage one from having children, but it does warn very carefully to the individual who has considered that the only road to personal happiness and fulfillment is to bear children and have a family. That may not necessarily be the only avenue. Now, when we say some of these things do not correlate to happiness, it's kind of hard to understand on a statistical average. It would indicate that couples with children are just as happy as couples without children, and that's the way the net result is. But on some of these, I think there's another way to look at it, and that would appear to be that there are happy and unhappy people in, some, in both groups. For example, there may be couples that are unfortunately unable to have children and are very unhappy. There may be couples that don't have children and are very happy, and likewise there may be couples who have children and it is the primary source of their fulfillment. That happens a good deal in the research, and there's also the possibility of many very unhappy couples who do have children. So. When you balance all that out, you come out with that kind of average that it's no real guarantee. Positive mental health sense that seems to count. Now, we suggested, of course, that the close love relationship, you know, is the number one source of personal happiness, and so therefore it should be no surprise that married couples traditionally, or married people, I'm sorry, traditionally in the data, or at least people who have someone else important in their love life, are statistically always happy than those individuals who are kind of going through life on their own. It's particularly true that couples who have recently lost in love, widowed, divorced, separated, are among the most unhappy groups in society, and probably as we suggested, one of the more unhappy periods in life that you have experienced. Additionally, interestingly though, something we may come back to in a little greater detail, there's a little bit of a sex difference when it comes to, you know, uh, marriage and happiness. 
it seems like the unhappiest group of all, according to you know some preliminary data, is single males. The next unhappiest group, and the next happiest group, is single females. But when they get married, something happens rather strange, or <laughs> maybe it's not strange at all. The next happiest group is married ma females, I'm sorry, and the happiest group of all is married males. So apparently males jump from the very bottom of the heap to the very hot top just by simply saying, I do. Some sort of sexist message in there. We suggested that happy individuals are very active socially, and indeed, they have personalities that are well suited for that. Popularity is not a bad term. It has often been used in the literature to describe the nature of happy individuals. But popularity is a kind of a shallow term. We psychologists discover that happy individuals tend to have very uh, healthy social styles. Their relationships are considered to be quite healthy, quite well adjusted, quite uh, rewarding in that sense. And so even though they may be quite well likable, quite socially outgoing, quite popular, that's a kind of a shallow term to describe the overall kind of depth and the uh, healthiness displayed by their, you know, interactions with others. Well, that's the social category. And we suggested this is the number one effector of personal happiness. But what about success? How important is that to happiness? Well, happy people apparently really don't have to choose. As we suggested, happy people, you know, kind of have it made in virtually every respect, and they're also marvelously successful individuals as a general rule. Now, basically, success and happiness may not be as strongly related as an active and rewarding social life is to personal happiness, but it does seem to have an effect. And in virtually every measure of social success, as you move up that particular success ladder, you'll find people are happier as you move to the top. Now, how does society measure success? Well, we measure success in lots of ways. The most fundamental, especially these days, seems to be income. How much money a person makes. Now, there's that old famous adage that money can't buy happiness, but I'm afraid, my friends, that's largely a myth. Indeed, income and happiness do correlate quite positively. The more money you tend to make, the happier you tend to be. But this particular category, like many of the others we will be discussing, discussing, is kind of subject to a law of diminishing returns. Certainly at the very lower levels, increases of income make dramatic differences in happiness rates, especially as you move away from the poverty zone up to about the national average income. But beyond that, the effect begins to taper off. I'll come back to the idea, that idea in a little bit. How else do we measure success socially? Well, we measure success in terms of social status and prestige. And once again, as you move up the status ladder, say, for example, the old traditional sociological class system, from lower class to lower middle class to middle middle class to upper middle class to lower upper class to upper upper class, I think there's some seven or eight distinctions there, you will find the members a little bit happier as you move up. Bear in mind, this is irrespective to the income they make. Two people both at the $50,000 level, statistically the person who had lived mostly in an upper class community and background would be a little happier than that same income person who had come from a more lower middle class background. So each one of these has an independent contribution to make. How else do we measure status? Well, occupational status is pretty obvious. As you move up the kind of occupational status ladder from blue collar to white collar to professional, you know, and all the little innuendos in between, we find people becoming increasingly happy as you move up that ladder. What about the status of occupations themselves? I mean, everybody knows, for example, that physicians are considered to be a lot more prestigious than, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, grocery store clerk, a lot more, who is maybe a little bit more prestigious than a, a garbage collector or something like that, who uh, is a little bit more prestigious than, say, a lawyer or something along that line, right? Well, as you move up the occupational ladder in these various status positions, which are quite well defined, you'll find the residents there a little bit happier. So once again, a physician and a lawyer, say for example, at the same you know, income level, the physician considered a little bit higher status generally would enjoy a little bit more happiness as far as that goes. What about job status, though, relatively? Well, we find out the more successful among peers tends to be the happier among peers. Ten people in the same factory lane. One has a little bit more seniority. The one has a little bit more prestige among his co-workers will tend to be happier. And one of the things we know about happiness is there's a strong relationship between happiness and leadership. Happy individuals seem to naturally gravitate to leadership positions and generally seem to enjoy a little bit higher status than their colleagues along the same level or in the same kind of organizational structure, so on and so forth. So, on almost every way we measure happiness, I'm sorry, in almost every way we measure success, 
happy individuals tend to kind of max out in each and every one of these categories. Uh, but beyond that, there's something even more important. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, let me backtrack a little bit. One other way we measure success in our society, generally, is educational success. How much education a person has has always traditionally been viewed as a kind of a success ladder. Obviously, many of you here, hopefully, are hoping to obtain some sort of greater success if the only success being the obtaining of a college or perhaps even further degree. And research indicates you're on the right track. Indeed, the further you go, academically and educationally throughout your life, the happier you will tend to be. But once again, as we start talking about education or some of these other topics, the impact, the real punch on lifelong happiness tends to become smaller and smaller. Unfortunately, even though a higher education or every extra year of school will make some broad statistical difference when we lump thousands of people in the computer, the effect is relatively minor, say maybe two or three points on a hundred point scale. When you consider the tremendous amount of effort that one puts into educational attainment, the happiness payoff may not be really all that great. So, I think one of the things that's becoming clearer as we go through the big board in the sky is that even though these things are probably things that you would have guessed contribute to happiness, I think the data is refining a great deal more as to which ones are really strong in their impact and which others make only a very minor contribution overall. That may be valuable in the future. Well, in addition to being successful on the outside, however, in terms of the way society basically measures success, there's also the success in personal terms. And in this particular way, happy individuals are remarkably successful once again. They tend to be especially adept at achieving most of their own personal goals in addition to these other measures of success. Happy individuals seem to be those lucky or insightful ones who seem to be able to get most everything they're after in life. They seem to be able to get the things that most of the rest of us seem to want and desire. Now, one of the reasons for this is apparently they are very competent, skillful people. Perhaps not musically or artistically talented in that sense, but in terms of everyday skills, abilities, competence, the ability to kind of take care of themselves and take care of business, so to speak, happy individuals tend to be quite competent. And I think this is part of the reason, you know, that they are able to achieve so much success, achieve so much recognition, respect, so on and so forth, in these other areas. But you will be pleased to know that one thing the data has indicated that is not related to happiness at all. And that seems to be IQ. Traditional IQ, whatever it measures, basic, naive, or innate intelligence, uh, perhaps the aptitude for academic pursuits, does not particularly seem to relate all that much to personal happiness, so that's a kind of a nice message. What that means is that everyone, you know, at least genetically speaking, for the most part, has an equal chance to be a happy person. You can be bright, and it's certainly not going to decrease your chances for happiness. In other words, you can be bright and quite happy, but even better, ha, you can be very dumb and also have the same equal chance for happiness. Now, this may be a little bit of a surprise here, though. Apparently, one other thing that IQ does not necessarily relate that strongly to, except perhaps at the very lowest levels, is just average competence, being able to be skillful, having abilities, having skills. So. Uh, IQ is not necessarily that required for happiness, but as you look over the success board here, the one thing that seems to be even more important than any of these factors is not the success happy individuals have achieved, although that does play an important part, it's how they got that success that really counts, and it's part of the reason they probably are as happy as they are. You see, in addition to everything else happy individuals have going for them, one of the major things is that they have careers or jobs that they find extremely fulfilling, rewarding, and happiness producing. Now, if you think about it, that is part, obviously, of the happiness picture. Who cares how successful or how status, you know, high you are in terms of others' eyes? It's how you actually get there that really counts. When you consider that you are spending a good 80% or will of your adult waking life just earning a living on the job, I think you can begin to see why happy people have it made in terms of the kinds of careers or jobs that they really find rewarding, fulfilling, and enjoyable. You can't really beat that formula. And because career choice is so incredibly important, one of the things we stress, especially, you know, in college audiences for you young people, 
is the fact that your number one happiness choice, really, overall, considering the incredible amount of time and investment you will spend in your working life, is the choice of your job or career. And if you were to follow the example of happy individuals, you would choose that career much more based on what you enjoy and find meaningful, challenging, and perhaps even fun to some degree than it would be to choose that career in terms of status or the direct income it may provide or other things like that. That is why we refer to your career as the number one happiness choice, the number one happiness choice you will ever make. Now, bear in mind, because we've already got another number one up here on the board, don't get a little confused. We suggested to you that you know, your marriage, your close love relationship is going to have the greatest punch, you know, the greatest impact on your personal happiness, and that's true. And yet we've also said that your job choice or your career choice is going to be the number one happiness choice you ever make. See if we can rectify that. The reason basically is this. Even though your love life will have a greater impact on your personal happiness, you have much less control over it. The talents, the skills, the ability, the education you receive, you know, the abilities and skills you develop through life are generally barring freak accidents are something that can be rarely taken away from you. They're kind of yours to rely on and keep. One of the doctor's old famous sayings kind of relates to that point. You know, in a sense, they can't really take your knowledge, your skills, your abilities and talents away from you, but they can certainly take your stuff. <laughs> I think you catch my drift. Well, my friends, I think you're beginning to see the overall picture of happy individuals having it made in virtually all of the social desirable categories that we would tend to describe. But there's more. If you're not sick yet, let's turn to page two. Now, we've got these in a little bit of reverse order, so I think I'll kind of start over here, well, maybe with the health category. The important thing to know about health is that health is a prerequisite to happiness, a prerequisite to happiness. And by this, what we mean is having it doesn't matter that much. Uh, losing it matters a lot. Now, what we mean by that essentially is that people who are in poor health, who have lost their health, especially physically poor, I mean physically painful health, or uh, you know, extremely expensive health problems, obviously that is going to greatly deplete one's ability to really be happy with life. And we have found that individuals who are in poor or ill health are not as happy as healthy people. But when we segregate healthy people by themselves, just being healthy doesn't seem to make much difference. Apparently, there are many healthy people who are quite happy, but there are many other people who are in good physical health who are miserably depressed and unhappy a great deal of the time. So, health is kind of a prerequisite, my friends. It gets you to the starting gate, and it's important, but it only gets you to the starting gate. How well you succeed in these other areas will then determine how happy or unhappy you tend to be. So, health is kind of a prerequisite. So, what about the big R, religion? Well, religion is kind of a strange uh, phenomenon when it comes to personal happiness. I guess in one sense we could definitely say that happy individuals are remarkably religious people. But it's exactly what religious belief they aspire to. We have not found any universal threads beyond very broad religious concepts. I guess what I'm sort of suggesting is a phrase that we refer to in the happiness research is not so important for happiness what you believe, it's that you believe. Now, let me see if I can describe what we're talking about here. We described last week, I think as we were going over the big R, some of the important things that religion provides. And in this sense, all happy people seem to have this in common. They do have a strong set of beliefs and values that are at the very core of their being. And these beliefs and values, sometimes physical, physio, uh, for what? sometimes philosophical, sometimes religious, seem to provide them a great deal of guidance in life they seem to also provide them a sense of meaning. They look at the life they look at life in very religious terms, in the sense that they have a kind of an awe and reverence and a respect from life for life. They seem to see a great deal of meaning and significance to their life and their particular role in it. They seem to see a great deal of purpose to life and seem to have that kind of a uh, a love of life that in its deepest sense is highly religious. And finally, the major thing that we have talked about or that we will be alluding to is that all of these things together, the strong inner core of values, the strong sense of meaning and significance, the strong sort of sense of purpose with their life, gives happy individuals a remarkable sense of direction. 
When we look at unhappy people, they seem to lack all of these things, even though they deem them maybe a member of a particular orthodox religion. Instead of finding purpose and meaning in a kind of a positive view of life, an awe and reverence of life, we find instead individuals who <clears throat> are not happy are quite confused. They, they're very uncertain of their beliefs and attitudes. They don't seem to have any sense of direction. There's really no sense of purpose to their life. Uh, and their beliefs seem to muddle their life, confuse their life, make them feel more sinful, guilt-ridden, more negative about themselves when they have beliefs at all. So, after all is said and done, I think we can simplify it by simply saying that it's not what you believe that counts, it's that you've got a belief. And I think that seems to be the main ingredient when it comes to personal happiness. The next category on the big board in the sky is the fun category, isn't it? Yes. Now, when you think of fun, think of happy people. Because happy individuals are the paragons of fun, my friends. When you think of, you know, when you talk about having a good time in life, having a lot of fun, you're really talking about happy people primarily. Happy individuals seem to spend just clockwise much more of their time in things that they have fun doing, that they really enjoy, that are stimulating, active, that are just good, clean fun. And in addition to that, they seem to have a tremendously broad interest, a wide variety of sports, hobbies, leisure time, you know, activities, things like that, uh, hobbies, stuff, that they really get a tremendous kick out of. And this tremendous potpourri of happiness sources or fun sources is something they tend to dip into most all the time. So really, in a sense, there may be quite an analogy, uh, uh, quite an analogy, I guess, of the fun theory of happiness. Apparently, the more fun one has, the happier life they have, and happy people seem to intuitively notice this or, or be aware of this because they seem to have fun most all the time. But one of the real catch-22s of this picture of fun is partially because of the many things happy individuals describe as being really fun time, interestingly enough, is actually their job and the time they spend earning a living they actually enjoy it, would consider it to be a kind of a fun thing. But you can't beat that. And in addition to that, one of the other things that happy individuals would describe as a lot of fun, something highly enjoyable, is their family and marriage relationships. So apparently in that sense, happy individuals are sort of having fun all the time. Now how fun would you describe your job? Not very, I imagine, if you're typical. How fun would you describe your family situation? I mean, hey, are they waiting for you now? So when you get home this evening, uh, you know, just wait. We've been waiting on you. Let's have fun. No, I, I, well, I hope so. For some of you, that's true. And you're probably remarkably happy people. I'm afraid that's a huge, two huge sources of things that most of us don't consider fun. And so, therefore, we examine our life compared to the happiest individuals. I think we can begin to see why our potential for happiness is so much greater than we're ever truly able to achieve. For most of us, fun is something we look forward to, what? Maybe a couple hours on the weekend if we're damn lucky. Well, after going all over that, oh, the beautiful world, we sort of skipped that, didn't we? It's a sad story because one of the things we can't change, my friends, at least not right here this evening, is the fact that really the world does, well, the world, let me rephrase that. The world has many beautiful aspects, but as an overall kind of a thing, we have to admit we're not living in the beautiful, ideal, utopian world that most of us would dream or would wish if we kind of ruled the world for a day or for a year. There is starvation. There is the threat of nuclear war. There are ecological catastrophes and calamities. There are, you know, the threat of nuclear plants. Uh, there uh, is disease. There is starvation. There is war. In a sense, we live on a very vicious planet in many ways, one that many young people, I find, are very depressed about their future in. So, how do happy people maintain their happiness when we live in a world that's really not that beautiful at all? Well, it's an interesting twist. Some might say that happy individuals lack compassion. They're really not all that concerned. They seem to be fiddling and having themselves a great old time while the world just sort of burns away. But that's not true at all. Interestingly, happy individuals tend to be much more compassionate than average, much more concerned about social issues and social problems, much more wishing for world peace and other more brotherly kind of human, you know, conditions and, and desires. But 
they don't seem to let those wishes and those dreams for a better world get in the way of spoiling their own personal happiness. Indeed, happy individuals typically do more about it. Often, according to some of the most recent data that we've collected worldwide, happy individuals volunteer a great deal and spend a lot of their spare time doing things for the community, for charities, for volunteer action committees, so on and so forth. Happy individuals do apparently do their bit. They're kind of working to make this a more beautiful world, but they don't let the fact that it's not kind of destroy their own personal happiness. So it's a kind of a delicate edge doesn't mean getting callous and unconcerned. It means remaining concerned, but being able to kind of draw the line at the rest of the world's problems before it starts really invading and destroying your own personal peace of mind and your own happiness. The marvelous trick that happy individuals are able to do, well, we've pretty much covered it, my friends. These are most of the categories that happy individuals have going for them that many of you probably don't. And it's a little bit of an irksome picture, I imagine. You know, happy people do have it made in virtually every category that we could name. Now, not that all happy people have all of these things. But the happiest seem to do pretty well at each and every one of them. And I think you can kind of begin to see how much happier a person you might conceivably be if you could say, yeah, boy, I have that. It's going really well. Uh, yeah, my relationship there is just superb. I am so happy and pleased and satisfied with it. Yeah, my kids are doing great. I'm so proud of them. They never give me a, a moment's trouble. Huh. Uh, yeah, i got about as many megabucks as I can handle. Yeah, my job is just, uh, I'm at the top of the heap. I'm really doing well. I just get such a kick out of my fulfilling career. I've got so much status, respect from my peers, admirers, friends, well-wishers everywhere sending me telegrams. Yeah, I, I, even, I even got my degree finally. Phew. Yeah. I think you can begin to see how much happier a person you could potentially be if indeed all of these things were to fall in your lap. Which brings us, my friends, unfortunately, to the bad news of happiness research. And the bad news is, unfortunately, that a lot of these good things in life may never come your way. I guess we could rephrase that too. But the bad news of happiness research is that we know a lot research-wise. We know of a lot of things that can, can contribute greatly to your personal happiness that most people never get in life. Many people may never have. Well, that's a little depressing, especially when you think about it in personal terms. There's a lot in the big boy in the sky that could make you happy, yes, but that perhaps many of those things might elude you. Now, in a way, I'm wishing for your great success and good luck. I'm hoping that you'll be one of the individuals who all of these things happen. But you have to be honest and realize that, say, you know, not all of us are going to enjoy a, a great marriage and not all of us are going to reach the top of the heap success-wise and not all of us are going to end up in a career that we really get a kick out of. It's going to be kind of a chore going to work. Maybe we'll have some fun on the weekends, but not all of us are really going to find life an economic breeze. It's always going to be a little tough coming up with cash at the end of the month to pay the bills. Some of us, all of us, are going to have model children. Some of us may go throughout life without sex. Ah! It could all happen. Well, all but that, see, I tell you, maybe you've got one happiness category you can count on, huh? That's great. Okay. Uh, and so on and so forth. So in a sense, that's kind of the bad, depressing news of happiness research. But wait a minute, maybe there's hope. There's one thing we haven't covered, is there? The mental health of happy individuals. Now, this is an interesting kind of thing to think about because, excuse me, and it's great with this chair. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people, I think, would kind of question the mental health status of the happiest people. A lot of times when I've discussed them before colleagues and other, you know, particularly learning groups, they, they have this sort of idea that, uh, well, happiness by itself, uh, these people may not be all together. They have the illusion of some insane people they know who appear to be quite happy. And maybe you're questioning that, too. How healthy, you know, emotionally speaking, how squared away, how well-adjusted, are these happy people anyway? I mean, maybe as they're flitting around in a giddy euphoria of success, social love, adventure, fun, and money, they're maybe kind of, you know, they're not really all together there. Maybe it's best that they're not, huh? Well, my friends, if you think that maybe there's one thing that happy people don't have <laughs> that you don't have either or whatever. Uh, bah! I'm sorry, to make a long story short, you're wrong once again. Indeed, one of the surprising and one of the most interesting conclusions of the happiness research and the thing that makes it so appropriate for our seminar series here in psychology is the fact 
that there is an incredibly strong connection between happiness and mental health. Indeed, happy individuals seem to be what we would refer to, my friends, as the paragons of mental health. In virtually every measure, virtually every personality test, virtually every long and short-term study, close clinical interviews, months of follow-up, of uh, life history, of uh, sociological and psychological analysis, happy individuals seem to max out. They t tend to score and they tend to be much healthier than average. In fact, the connection between happiness and mental health is so strong that we're beginning to believe that the two are sort of inextricably related that happiness kind of is mental health and that mental health in many ways is happiness or maybe putting it a little bit more understandably in light of our previous discussion maybe once again we're talking about ends versus means or causes versus effects like everything else good mental health should ideally have some sort of a payoff and particularly we call it emotional health it should be a kind of an emotional payoff so what we're seeing essentially in the data is that mental health, once again, is a kind of a means, in a sense, with happiness being the end result. Or, in a sense, happiness is nature's way of rewarding us for healthy development in life. Happiness is kind of nature's primary symptom of good mental health. But happiness, in a sense, joy, a feeling of fulfillment, is what mental health is all about. Well, nonetheless, apparently, therefore, happy individuals have it made, and this, in a sense, I guess, is kind of the bad, depressing news of happiness research. Uh, in a sense, I guess we could just kind of sort of leave you just kind of like you are. Take this and do what you can with it. Most of you are saying, well, maybe if I can be a millionaire next year, huh? yeah, that ought to do it. And so on and so forth. If this was all there was to the happiness picture, I grant you it would be a kind of a depressing situation to deal with, wouldn't it? But, fortunately, this is not all the picture. Indeed, there is a little subtle difference that we'll talk about at our next session. But in a sense, what we've relied on here this evening is talking pretty much more about the external things that happy people have going for them. Uh, the things we could discover by kind of following them around for a little while. Yeah, they're married. Yeah, they've got a nice car. Yeah, they're living in a good home. Yeah, their kids seem to be free of drugs or something like that. Yeah, they seem to just go to a lot of clubs and things along this line. These are the more objective outside things. But interestingly enough, the research has also discovered things that I believe are going to be much more helpful to you. And those are the kinds of things about happy individuals that are more on the inside, more about the way they think, the way they behave, their kind of approach to life. Now, in that sense, I think there may be some surprising lessons that you can really profit from. And we will begin with those lessons the next time we get together. So, I appreciate your attention here this evening, and we'll be back soon. Well, there you have it, my friends. Now you know, too, what happy people have that most people probably don't. In fact, you probably know a little bit no more now about what happy people have that maybe even you yourself don't enjoy. Well, don't get depressed about it. That's not the object of the Psychology of Happiness series. Our job is to make you happy. But still, as we've examined some of these fine things that happy people have this evening, perhaps you found yourself getting a little downhearted, thinking that, gosh, you know, it would be nice to have all those fine things, and perhaps asking yourself, can I be happy with, you know, if I don't achieve those things? Well, that's a good question, and a question we'll be examining in our next program, because interestingly, my friends, even though this evening we've had a little hint of what the bad news is regarding happiness research, there's also good news. And that good news is the 14 Fundamentals Program that we have developed right here and researched that can help you greatly increase your happiness, even if all these other fine things don't necessarily happen. Kind of a fascinating little, you know, idea to ponder, isn't it? Well, if you're the least bit excited about that and would like to know more about what you can do, then our next program in the series is going to be essential for you. And we've entitled that program, aptly enough, the good news and the bad news of happiness research. So, we'll see you for that program next time we get together. Well, let's see if we can get a few shots out of this. <clears throat> Perhaps that we can. 
will be happy with me to organize this video tape. <coughs> Not really sure quite um, what you think of that. You can have a day to do that. Yeah, that's pretty good. From that point, there yeah, I am pretty much squared away, and I appreciate it. Really did. Uh, of course, I can come back around like this, I guess, and still, you know, way out of the past. I don't know on the screen. I think I can go from this point here, apparently, to about this point here, and still be somewhat on the screen. I sure don't like myself in green, I must admit. It's a little ridiculous. Uh, Lose my equipment here, guys. This is what I said.